All right, well, good evening, everyone. Let's stand to our feet and let's sing number 88, Jesus Saves. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the tidings all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Bear the news to every land. Find the saves, wash the ways. On what is our Lord's command. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Often on the rolling tide. To sinners far and wide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing the islands of the sea, echo back the ocean's waves. Wretch on the Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Sing above the battle strife, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. By his death. softly through the blue when the heart for mercy craves sing and try for the two Jesus saves Jesus saves give the winds a mighty voice Jesus saves Jesus saves let the nations now rejoice Jesus saves Jesus saves shout salvation Great to see everyone tonight. Let's just do a little bit of worship tonight. Number 94. Little is much when God is in it. In the harvest field now ripen, there's a work for all to do. Hark the voice of God is calling to the heart. Is calling you. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Does the place you're called to labor seem so small and little known? It is great if God is in it and will not forget his own. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. Are you laid aside from service, body worn from toil and care? You can still be in the battle in the same place of prayer. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it if you'll go in Jesus' name. When the conflict here is ended and our race on earth is run, he will say to all the faithful, Welcome home, my child, well done. Little is much when God is in it. Labor not for wealth or fame. There's a crown and you can win it. If you'll go in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated for our next song. with your heart tonight. You ready? I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His 
than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand than to great words we're singing. You ready? I'd rather have Jesus than men's applause. I'd rather be faithful to his dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be true to his whole of God tonight and to worship and let's do that in this next song sing along if you know it how great is our God anyone have a testimony You know, I'll, I'll give one real quick anyway. Um, this uh, past semester, I've been at college, um, and it was a different situation, obviously, with COVID and all that. It's just school has been a lot different, but uh, God was still just as great as he was the last year and the year before and the year before that. And, you know, even though college can be different and, you know, situationally, we can be, dis you know, in discomfort, you know, God was great through every single moment. And he showed me a lot about myself this past year. And I'm, I'm very thankful for that. And uh, when you get in the light of God, he really starts showing you who you are. And uh, like Isaiah says, woe is me. When he got in the presence of God, he said, woe is me. And... Uh, Let's worship tonight as we sing how great our God is.
He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. How great! Beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one. Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great. Great singing tonight. All right. I believe we're ready for the preacher. <laughs> uh, we appreciate it. Thank you, church. Uh, as I said this morning, we really appreciate you guys for being so faithful, uh, for praying for us, and just... Um, uh, uh, supporting us and just like it, it's been it's been great to be here uh, just to be back here and just to report on what God has been doing through us there in Tanzania East Africa and it's just uh, it's just amazing um, and and I just like to give maybe someone had a question about our ministry again uh, what we are doing over there and everything so if you have any question maybe open it up and just to see if anyone has any question. Anybody? Maybe you didn't ask the question this morning, but you wanted to ask right now. Yes, ma'am. Uh, yeah, they are, uh, it's mixed. Some, they come from nearby the church. They just walk to the church. And some, they come from different areas where we send the buses. Uh, the farthest one is like 30 minutes away. So we send these buses everywhere, and then to pick them up, yeah, so they, they come through the buses. Yes, ma'am. Anyone else has any question about the church or the ministry? Yeah, someone asked me, what do they speak? They speak Swahili. And growing up there, I spoke Swahili all my life. And um, um, I can quote John 3.16 in Swahili. Uh, for you, I hope I remember very well. Okay. <laughs> I've been back here for almost six months now. It's like you forget everything. Um, it's John 3, 16. Uh, Johanna, tatu, kuminasita. Komana jinsi mungu wa liupenda ulimwengu wa takamtoa mwanae wa peke ili kila mtu wa mwaminia spote. 
But yeah, when I was in my own life, that's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Yeah, so the six were here. And we have over uh, 60, 60, over 60 million people in the country. And the country is as big as uh, if you take the state of California and Texas combined, that's how big the country is. So, yeah. Um, any other question? Anybody? What's the population of the town that you're in? Uh, the town we're in is Morogoro, and we have over 500,000 people there. Yeah, so it's spread apart, but there's a lot of people. Like, our house is about 30 minutes away from the church. We built our house, and then we got the land on the other side. And it's a new area where people are moving in on that area. There's no churches or nothing, so we decided to go over there and reach those people there. Yeah, it's about 500,000 there. Yeah, anyone else? Yes. Yes, they do give us freedom. We are free to do anything. Like if you have, if you want to have the like an open air meeting outside, you just have to go to the police and ask for the permits they give to you, and you can do whatever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes, we were able to reach some of the Muslim like people, and also um, like uh, a few of them, we were able to reach them out. And when when we reach them out, they start coming to church. They are very fearful and scared, and sometimes they call me. They say, "Oh, they, my family, they don't want to talk to me anymore because I became a Christian." And as I said, even this morning, like we just give them time. I say, "The only thing I can tell you right now." I think they are mad and everything. We know that, but the thing is, like, just see, it's gonna take time. Give them time. Time will heal, will help, and everything else will go well. So, uh, when they give them some times, they just becoming normal. It's not a problem anymore. Yeah, we have few Muslim uh, people in in our church. Yeah, they came from to be a Muslim. Now they're Christians. Yeah. Any other question? <laughs> All right. If you, have, you don't have any question, let's open our Bibles in the book of 2 Kings, uh, chapter number 7. 2 Kings, chapter number 7. Second Kings, chapter number 7. Uh, let's start reading on verse number 1. 2 Kings chapter number 7 and verse number 1. The Bible says, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord, thus saith the Lord. Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of a barley for a shekel and, uh, in, the gates, in the gate of Samaria. Then then a Lord who, uh, on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God, said, Behold, if the, if the Lord would make uh, windows in heaven, might this, uh, might this, might this thing be? And he, he said, Behold, thou shalt see it uh, with thine eyes, but shall not eat there, uh, thereof. Verse number four, uh, three. And there were, there were four leprous men, at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? And that's my key verse for tonight. And the title of my message is, Why sit we here until we die? Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for what you have done for us. Thank you for uh, the morning service. And then we came back tonight. Thank you for these people who came here tonight. And Lord, I'm just asking you to come and uh, just help us to understand your word as I preach your word. Just help me, hide me behind the cross, and uh, you can help your people. These are your people, Lord. Just help me. In Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Uh, in 2 Kings chapter number 7 and verse number 3, uh, the Bible says at the end of that verse, it says, Why sit we here 
until we die. And that's the title of my message. Um, uh, I'll, start, uh, I'll start like this morning. I started by asking a question. Um, what are you going to do with your life? What are you going to do with your life? What's your, what's your goal in life? What's the goal do you have in life? Um, is your goal education, to get education? Is your goal is to have a baby maybe? Is your goal is to get married? Or is your goal is to build a home? Uh, what's your goal? Maybe it's your, your goal is to make a lot of money. Um, did God real place you on, uh, on this earth to sit and die? Did God just put you on earth here just to sit and die? I mean, I was talking to someone even uh, like on the phone even this afternoon. It's the evening over there, and then they were so hurt. And then I said, how long have you been in church? And because of the hurt they went through, I said, ah, I don't remember, maybe five months or six months, um, I haven't been in church. I said, I know what you're going through, but, you know, the only place to be is in the house of God. They are hurt and everything. And then I said, okay, you went back home. So you're back home with your parents. So what do you do with your life there? I said, I, I don't know. I said, did you just go back home to live with your parents and everything? Um, just, you just get up, you eat, you go to sleep, you wake up, you eat, you sleep, until you get old, until like you die. That's your goal? I was asking them. I said, no. So I was trying to try to help them out. But what's your goal in life, Like, Did God create you and put you on earth to just to sit and die? Why has God brought you to this church? Why did God bring you to this church? You know, why did God allow you to have salvation, to be saved? Why did God allow you? You know, there's so many people like they're not saved, but you are the only one. You are the one who are saved right now. You are saved. And you are saved if you are going to heaven. Why did God allow that to happen in your life? Why didn't he, uh, he could stop and you could be like so, some other people were not saved, but that grace of God happened in your life. God brought that salvation to you. Why did he do that? Let us look at the, uh, the example of these four lepers. Um, they finally, uh, they finally said one to another, why sit we here until we die? At this particular moment, the children of Israel, uh, the nation of Israel, they were going through the famine. There was no food in the land. They were just struggling even to get food. And the power is like, even like it reaches a point, like uh, they were eating their babies. I mean, like the mother, they give their babies, they cook their babies and they eat. They eat the dung and everything. It was very severe famine in the land. And we know that Elisha told them, hey, tomorrow things are going to change. And then this guy didn't believe the word of the prophet Elisha. And then he said, ah, you know, what? maybe the windows of, of heaven to open up and God bring the blessing and everything. He was mocking the, the man of God. He said, hey, you're going to see it, but you're not going to test it because you're going to die. You know, and the, and the thing is, like, there were four men, there were four lepers. They say at the entering in of the gate in the city. And those four men, they had leprous disease. And now what's happened is that that disease was very contagious. And we know that in order for, to contain the disease, they had to separate the people. They had to put some people outside the gate. And then they can stay there until they get cranes or get healed. And now these four men, because they were hungry, they say, if we go to town, we're going to die. If we sit here, we're going to die. They ask a question. They say one to another. Why sit we here until we die? And that's the same question I would like to leave it to you. Why do we sit here until we die? We have to do something. We have to do something with our lives to serve God because we can learn some few points here uh, from these four lepers and then we will know like what they decided we can, we can see even in our lives. Point number one, point number one, no matter what you do in life, you will die. No matter what you do in life, you will die. 
In 2 King, uh, 2 King uh, chapter number 7, verse 3 and 4, um, uh, 3 and 4, the Bible says, And there were, four, uh, there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Verse number 4, If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the, land, in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us uh, fall unto uh, the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. You know, uh, these people, they say, you know what? If we sit here, we're going to die. If we go to the camp in Assyria, we're going to die. So might as well do something. No matter what you do in life, you will die. We are in the same position as these lepers today. I know this is not an amazing truth, but many Christians never seem to grasp it. If you do God's will, you will die one day. I mean, if you do God's will, you will die. If you don't do God's will, you will die one day. Sometimes, sometimes we will die sooner or later. If you are saved, you will die and live eternally in heaven. And so why not, why not do God's will and save him with your life? You can look at 1 John 2.17, but um, we have to do God's will. You know, the difference between... The man who dies doing God's will and the man who dies doing, uh, doing his own will. The one who dies doing God's will is a blessing and joy they have here on earth. Like he, someone who is saved and, and dying doing God's will, they have a blessing and joy. Because they know that one day they're going to meet God. Whatever they do here, like they're investing up in heaven. That's the same thing even we uh, today, we need to invest up in heaven, not in our own lives. Either way, point number one, I said, no matter what you do in life, you will die. If you're saved or you're not saved, you will die. If you do God's will or if you don't do God's will, you will die. So point number two, the second point, we must come to the point we are willing to die to do God's will. We must come to the point that we are willing to die Doing God's will. Um, you can read on Philippians 1.21 there. Paul is saying here, at either in death or in life, his life is to save Christ. He was saying, I'm going to save Christ even if I die doing so. Uh, if I die, I'll be going to Christ anyways. And that's a gain. He said, that's a gain. If, and if I die doing God's will, I'll be going to heaven. And that's the gain for him. You know, these lepers said uh, the same thing in their physical state. They did not care. If they died, they left. Uh, they felt compelled to go. And they knew that that was the right thing to do. They knew this is the right thing to do. We have to go to the city. Um, I'll give you an example. For instance, um, missionary Calvert about his mission's work. Uh, there was a missionary, uh, James Calvert, was a missionary to the cannibals of Fiji Island. When, um, when he and his fellow missionaries landed in the island, the captain of the ship that brought them uh, tried to tell them to turn back. He said, hey guys, let's turn back. I know these people, they are bad people here in the Fiji Island. The captain said, you will die. The men will, uh, with you will die. If you stay here, he cried. That captain cried. And after a moment, this missionary replied simply said, we died before we came here. So no matter what, we died before we came here. We know even if these people, they're going to kill us, they're going to eat us. You know why? We surrendered to God and that's why we're here. We died before we got here. So you can leave us here. We can minister to these people. You can go home, Captain. That's a missionary. Are you willing to die so your life can save others? Are you willing to give your life to die to say, hey, this is my life. I live for other people. Are you willing to live your life in a way that others can be directed to Jesus Christ and be saved? Are you willing to live 
your life in a way that others can be directed to Jesus Christ. You know, I'll give you another example. Just uh, an illustration of the shovel. The shovel. The story is told of some Scottish soldiers uh, forced by their Japanese captors to labor in the jungle railroad. The men had been had degenerated uh, to be a barbarous behavior. But one afternoon, something happened. A shovel was missing. One afternoon, the shovel was missing. The officer in charge became so enraged, he demanded that, shovel, that missing shovel to be produced or else he will kill everybody. When nobody in the squadron budged, the officer got his gun and threatened to kill them all on the spot. It was obvious the officer meant what he said. Then finally, one man stepped forward. One man stepped forward. The officer put away his gun, picked up the shovel, and beat the man to death. When it was over, the survivors picked up the, the blood corpse and carried it with them to the second toll check. They carried the body to the second toll check. This time, no shovel was missing. Indeed, there, were, there had been a miscount on the first checkpoint. The shovel was there. There has been a miscount on the first checkpoint. The, uh, the word spread like a wildfire throughout the whole camp. An innocent man had been willing to die to save others. The incident is a, uh, is a profound effect. The men began to treat each other like brothers. When the victorious arrows swept in, the survivors, human skeletons, lined up in front of their captors. And instead of attacking their captors, ins insisted, no more hatred, no more killing. Now what we need is forgiveness. The shovel was missing. But one man said, I don't want you to kill them all. You can kill me and they can be alive. He sacrificed his life to save the rest of the man. He died for the rest of the man. And things have changed on that particular day. You know, God may not ask you to die to do his will. Most likely he will ask you to live to do his will and die to yourself. God will ask you to die to yourself, to do his will. Give up your own dreams and your own aspirations. We all have dreams. I mean, I wanted to be a pastor. I wanted to, to graduate from high school, to go to a big city, to go to a university. And I wanted to, to get uh, a degree on international relations. I believe like, uh, I'll, get, I'll make more money and everything. Those are my dreams. Everybody has dreams. But when a missionary came and I've seen God working in his life and I wanted to save God, you know why? Those dreams, I put them aside. I came here, I went to a Bible college. And for four years, I graduated from a Bible college. I went on deputation almost for another four years. Those are like eight years. And for us to be able to go back to Tanzania. Sometimes we have to give our own dreams. Just say, God, whatever you have for me, I'm here. Here am I. Use me, God. We need to ask you, especially you young people. You need to see your future. We have a lot of things in mind. Yes, we can get American dream. Yes, we all want the American dream. But one day, we're going to stand before God. And we have to answer ourselves, God has given us a good country. God has given us a good health. God has given us a good family, good kids and everything. And what did you do with your life? What are you going to answer? And you know there's so many things you can give up maybe just to save God. I'm not saying everyone has to be a missionary. No, some people have to stay to hold the fort here to help and support those missionaries. But some has to go. And some has to surrender their will, say, hey, God, whatever you want, I'll do it. You can go to Bible college. And serving God, it didn't require a Bible college degree. Because when we go before God, he's not going to ask you what college you need to go to. He's not. 
He's going to ask, what did you do with the life I gave you? And we have to ask ourselves, like, hey, I'm here. Sometimes I have to give up my own dreams and aspirations. Point number three, when he calls, he will provide. When God calls you, he will provide. When you talk to the missionaries, especially of those who are starting deputation, I know it's a wrong road ahead of them and everything, and sometimes they want, I don't know if God will provide for me. I can tell you story after story, like we start, we start deputation, no one knows me. We send these packets of information. We are trying to make some phone calls to different pastors and everything. And yes, sometimes you want, like, will God provide? But I can tell you, if real God calls you and God has called you, he will provide. Not in your own time, but he will provide. We went through, like, we went through 45 states in the United States, almost finishing the whole country of the U.S. From east coast to west coast, up north and south and everywhere in between. We went and we traveled a lot of miles. We stayed to different people's houses. We stayed in the hotels. We lived in a suitcase for almost four years. I mean, you are tired. You just want to be home. You just want to... Be home and establish yourself at home. And you can have your breakfast you want to. You can wake up at this certain time, but now you just keep moving like every week you're in a different church. And, but along the way, we never lack anything. God provided us everything. I mean, we didn't know what to expect on deputation. I mean, it's been a blessing. We learned a lot of things. It's a life of faith. We learned a lot of things when we were on reputation. We met a lot of people. We made a lot of friends and everything. I mean, we have seen the heart of the people. Wherever you go in America to different churches, people, they do give sacrificially. They sacrifice. They don't have to give to the missionary. But because they love God, they love missionaries, they sacrifice. Some people, they work two, three different jobs. They still have to provide for their family. They still have to provide for the work of God. They do work hard. And you know why? We met all those kind of people, and we really appreciate God taking us through deputation. We can learn a lot of things and appreciate people here. You know, so when God calls you, we never ran out of gas. We got some churches, pastor put gas in our car. We get some churches like uh, people are being a blessing to you. You know, like from the vehicle and houses and staying here and there, we have met a lot of good people. Even if the world out there, they seems to be bad, there's a lot of good people in this country. And, and we learn a lot of things. Uh, we learn about tra- trusting God and God provided for us. And I can tell you, when God calls you, God will provide. God will provide. In 2 Kings 7, verse number 5 and 6, the Bible says, And they rose up in, uh, in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. Verse number 6, the Bible says, For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of Egyptian to come upon us. They never even think these Syrians. They surrounded the, the children of Israel. They were surrounded. And now the enemy... They are there, and these lepers, they say, hey, let's go to the camp of Syria. And then when they were walking, going to the camp, God put fear to their enemy, and then their enemy ran away. When they ran away, they left everything, food, some uh, silver, and, and all the stuff, they left them away in the tents. You know, that's why I said when God told them to go in, they obeyed God. God provided for them. When they walked in there, they ate until they dropped. They say, you know, where are the enemies? There's nobody here in the camp. They ran away. And now they eat the food and everything we'll see on the story. Uh, 
These people, when these men obeyed God's call, God had already worked out the miracle. So when, when you obey God's call, God has already planned something else for you. There are things in life you're not going to lack because, you know what, God has already, if he called you, he's going to provide. When God called, he had already ran uh, the army off. When he put the, the thought in their hearts, he had already worked out the plan. Think about this miracle that God did. He had the enemy believe there was a great army coming to help. They did not stop and think any question. How could the Israelites have hired an army when we have surrounded them? The, the enemy can't think straight here. I mean, how come we surrounded them? And then how come can they go? Where could they go and hire these people to come and fight against us? They never think because God put fear into them. What would they have used to hire them? When our Father in heaven calls, he will provide a way. Whether his command is in the word or his specific will for your life, God will provide. Maybe a call to preach, a call to be a faithful church member, a call to tithe, a call to teach, a call to help others, a call to be a, uh, a witness, God will provide. And sometimes we are very fearful, uh, how can I witness to somebody? You know why? God will give you strength when you need it. First of all, you need to obey the call of God. If there's something in your heart and God has spoken with you, you need to obey. I mean, don't be so stubborn like you hear the word of God. You don't want to respond. And that's, that's very bad. When you hear the word of God and God has spoken to you, you need to have a tender heart. You need to respond. And that God can work in your life. Point number four, there was no man. 2 Kings 7, verse number 5. There was no man. Why was there no Israelites trying to gather a group to fight in the, uh, in the name of the Lord? Why? Why there's no man? I mean, there's no any Israelite trying to gather a group of men to go fight the enemy? Why? Had not 300 men with Gideon conquered a thousand? If you remember the story of Gideon, Gideon was scared. He was hiding, and God came to Gideon and then said, Hey, hey, thou mighty, mighty man of valor. I said, I'm not a mighty man of valor. I'm just hiding here. He said, I'm going to use you. You're going to go fight for my people. And then we know the story. It took a lot of people, and God told them to try this man and someone who did this way. They sent them back home, those who were fearful and everything. And then he ended up having uh, uh, 300 people going with them. And they won the battle because God was, was on their side. Could not God do it again? Like, why there was no man? In the children of Israel, they were fearful and scared and hiding. They were surrounded by the enemy. Why there was no man to go fight against the, uh, that enemy? Why there was no man? You remember the story of David went there and fought the Philistine. There was a man because there was a cause. And then he went fight against them. You know, I have held uh, and this, uh, and this phrase in the times in the Bible, Ezekiel twenty two thirty. 30. Uh, God was looking for a man to send in the gap. You know, God is still looking for a man to send in the gap. God is still looking for people who can serve him. You know, yes, there's an empty, uh, there's print that we line up to. There's a lot of people we line up to. Enjoy the world pressure. There's a lot of people, there's plenty of people we line up to meet up with the girls in the night. There's a lot of people we line up to drink alcohol. There's a lot of people we line up to, do, to cuss. There's a lot of people who line up to gamble, to steal, to do bad things. There's a lot of people who we line up to. But where are those who will save the Lord? Where are those who serve the Lord? Where are those who, who they will deny themselves? Where are those who will resist temptation? The line to serve the Lord is normally pretty empty. But the, uh, there's a print of room in the Lord's line. You can join in the Lord's line because there's print of room because there are so many people that like to serve the world out there but not to serve God. 
There is a story of one-legged missionary. There's one-legged missionary. His name was George Scott, a one-legged missionary, uh, a one-legged school teacher from Scotland. George Scott was a one-legged school teacher from Scotland, volunteered for a missionary service in China. When asked why, why he, with one leg, thought going to China, he said, I do not see those with two legs going, so I must. So I must. Thus began his more than 20 years of missionary work in China. Because those abled people with two legs, they don't want to go. And George Scott from Scotland, he, he said, you know, I don't see those people who are able to go. They're not going, so I must go. I must go. How about you, Christian, today? There's a big group following after the world. Maybe many of them are your world friends. Let them go be willing to be one of the few. Let them go and serve the world out there, but be willing to be one of the few. God is looking for the few people who are willing uh, to serve him. We see again the need for someone to stand, but there was no men, even in Isaiah 41, 28. There was no men among Israelites. God is looking now for those who are willing to stand, no matter what will be. Will you be the, that man? God is looking for that man. Point number five. The world has no stand. The world out there has no stand. In 2 Kings 7, 6 and 7, you can read there, uh, these men ran when there was no real danger. There was no danger, but these Syrians, they ran away. They were scared. God put fear in them. They ran away. You know, they were, they were wrong in the first place for fighting against God's chosen people. In Proverbs 21, 8, you can read there. We have, uh, uh, when, when have you ever seen or held a lion run because he was scared? The lion doesn't run because he's scared. No, he's not running. Let me tell, uh, I will take you like he, uh, we have a national park there, like you've seen those animals in the morning. Uh, we have, uh, it's about two hours away, there's a national park. I can take you there, and there you can see the lions, you can see zebra, antelopes, and all these animals. But the lion is always not scared. He's like, it's like a king of the jungle, like he, no one scares him. He cannot run away, even if you try to scare him, he will defend himself. You know, but... These bad people, they ran away without no one chasing them because they knew that they were not doing right. Even in Psalms 1, 3, and 4, you can read there, the world is constant worried. They run when nobody is chasing them. If the husbands are worried their wives will find out what they are doing. Wives are worried their husband will see their phones. Teens are afraid uh, their father will hear about how they had been meeting up at night. Thieves are afraid they will get caught. Con artists, you know, worried someone will, will recognize them. They are worried that their own friends will turn on them. They never live in peace. The Bible says that the godly man is not like that. The godly man is not like that. He's not afraid of if he gets um, he gets a hold of, uh, if his wife gets hold of his phone, uh, uh, she's not worried if her husband comes home early. He's not worried if his wife stopped by his work. The teen will, will gladly talk about their relationship with their parents. She will not be embarrassed if her parents held that what he and her boyfriend were talking about on the phone. The God remain is not afraid. If you're afraid, you are doing something wrong. And you know that. You are not, you, are, you like the teens, like you don't have to be afraid if your mom or your dad gets hold of your phone. Uh, you're not afraid of if they can hear what you're talking about with your friends or with your boyfriend or your girlfriend. The God remain is not afraid. Point number six, God will use anybody. God will use anybody. 
Realize God is using four lepers to bring about his great salvation. Many who could not even come into the city. They were scared. They were hanging outside the gate. They realized when war were to break out, they were the first one to feel the heat. You know, remember these men were the outcasts in the society. Nobody wanted them, but God used them. Amen. I mean, nobody, nobody wanted the leprous people to be used. Like they didn't want them in the society. They were cast away. They say, you are no use over here. But you know why? God used them to bring great salvation to the people of Israel that day. God wants to use you. It doesn't matter how young you are. It doesn't matter how old you are. If you do not have education, God wants to use you. If you have a good look or bad look or you're angry, whatever, God wants to use you. If you are funny or you are not funny, God wants to use you. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter what you have done yesterday. God still wants to use you. Amen. God is there, wants to use you. Maybe you are, your family, they don't want you. They are tired of you. You are too spiritual, whatever. You know why? God still wants to use you. God is still looking for a man. Point number seven. I'm hurrying here. I'm about to finish. There's always a great blessing when we obey God's call. There's always a great blessing when we obey God's call. In 2 Kings uh, uh, chapter number 7, verse number 8, you can read there. These men ate until they could not eat anymore. They gathered money and food and many other things. They enjoyed the blessing. They were willing to give their lives and they reaped a reward. Those who are willing to give up something will be blessed by the Lord. God will bless those who are willing to give up something for his work. Our Father in heaven will repay you what you have given up 100 fold in, his, in this life. This is not all we will have, um, eter- we will have eternal life to. Point number eight, very quick. Never stop doing the most important thing in life. Never stop doing the most important thing in life. Uh, 2 Kings 7, verse number 9 there, you can look. Is eating wrong? No, eating is not wrong. Is getting money wrong? No, getting money is not wrong. We need to get money. We need to eat. Is enjoying yourself wrong? No, it's not wrong. Is putting money away for a rainy day? Is that wrong? No, it's not wrong. Is it if you have the greatest news of salvation and you're too busy doing those things and tell, and to tell anyone about it, they realize they had the great news and they need to tell somebody. They say, hey, guys, we're going to do them not good. I mean, something evil is going to come upon us if we don't go tell them. And you and me, we know the gospel. We are saved. If we don't tell other people, we're not doing them good. We need to tell other people about Jesus Christ. You know, uh, we need to stop and look at our lives from time to time and ask if we are doing the most important thing. Work is good. But is that taking place for church? Education is good, but is it taking place for the Bible study? Family is good, but are they pulling you away from the Bible principles you know and you believe? Singing in the choir is good, but is it taking a place of witnessing to others? Let us constantly be uh, taking inventory of our lives and our time and make sure we are spending time doing the most important thing in life. Point number nine, the last one. Let us keep, uh, let us not keep this great news to ourselves. Let, let us not keep this great news to ourselves in verse number nine. They could not keep this wonderful news of salvation to themselves, can you? Salvation has come to you. Are you silent? Salvation has come to you. Don't be silent. That is, that is what we have uh, we have been commanded to do in Matthew 5, 14 and 16. Our job is to shine the light of the gospel. The light, you are the light of the world. The Bible says you are the light of the world. That light came to you because of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the light of the world in John chapter 1 over there. He is the light of the world. You know, light is very important. The world is in darkness. So even if this room you will cover all the windows and there's no light and you try to paint and beautiful paint color, 
Those colors will mean nothing. It's not going to be beautiful, those colors, if there's no light. We need the light, and the only thing removes darkness is light. The light can remove darkness. We have a lot of hatred and everything in the country, in different community. We need to bring them the light because they're in darkness. We need to bring them the gospel. You are the light of the world. We are the light of the world. You are not the light of the world because you are good, you have education, or you have this and that. You are light of the world because of Jesus. And that Jesus Christ imparted that light of, to you, to the woman at the well in Samaria. He gave that light to those people. He, he gave that light to these disciples like John, Peter, James. He gave that light to them. And those disciples, they, they, they parted that light to you and me even today. You are the light of the world because of Jesus Christ. And you have to be a witness to him. We have to go to the world and remove the darkness, the hatred, and everything Jesus can solve. If we go to him, if we surrender our life to him, or we might decide just to sit here until we die. Unless we have to do something. These lepers, they did something. They did something. Don't let uh, uh, Kaepernick, whatever, the football player, and everything else, whatever, what they stand for, oh, I did something. No, we as a Christian, we can do something. Don't let these uh, athletes, they pay, they can pay millions of money to disrespect the country. I mean, they're shaming the country they live in. They get paid millions of money to disrespect the flag and people fought for this country. They think they did something to catch the ball, but someone defended their freedom somewhere. We don't let that do. Let's, let's just do something for the work of God. You and I, we are the hope of this nation. We can pray. We can do something. And these lepers, they didn't just sit there and say, hey, we're just going to die here. We don't have food. We are hungry. We might as well die. Might as well die doing something. And they did something. They went in the camp, and because they obeyed God's call, they went in, the God, and God chased their enemy away. They got plenty of food, and they were able to save the, the children of Israel. Let's do something. I'm finishing up here. Uh, would, you be, uh, would you be the one to get that call if God has called you? Every Christian needs to preach the gospel to every creature. Every Christian needs to preach the gospel to every creature. When we come in contact with the lost, we must ask them about if they're saved or not. These lepers knew how people were starving. It did not matter how much money they got, they had to share the good news. It did not matter if people uh, despised them, they had to share the good news. We have the greatest job of spreading the good news of the gospel. I'm going to end with this illustration. Missionary in China and a job. Many years ago, a young man went to China as a missionary with an income of 2500 annually a year. A company decided that they wanted this young man to work for them, and they offered him a position with $3,000 salary. He declined the offer, and he was raised to $7,000, and then $10,000. But he is still denied. The company asked him if the salary was his sticking point, and he answered them, oh, the salary is big enough, but the job is not. The salary is big enough, but the job is not. It doesn't matter how much you get paid, but when you go and put your head in the pillow in the night and you see all those people you told, you work, you witness to them, and then like Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul said, what is our joy, our hope, our joy in 2 Thessalonians 2.19? What is our joy and hope? It's just to see those people who had been going to hell, but now they're in heaven because I stayed. Apostle Paul went through a lot of things in his life. He could say, I quit. I'm done. He went to shipwreck. Yeah, they put him in prison. They beat him to death. And so many other things happened to Apostle Paul. But he never quit because he said, what is our hope and joy and crown of rejoicing? 
It's that those we can see them walking into heaven and seeing Jesus because they didn't quit. But Apostle Paul didn't quit. He stayed even if the going was tough. I mean, they, sometimes in a Christian life, the going will get tough. But are you going to continue to work for God even if the going gets tough? Why sit we here until we die? Thank you, Pastor. And um, heads bowed and eyes closed. And um, what's, it's, it's kind of hard to even give an invitation after that. He hit us with both barrels of the shotgun there. Um, we, we need that. We, every once in a while, we need to get refocused on what is the purpose of our lives and are we focused on that. We're all going to die. And at the end, what will it be said that we had invested our life in? What had we accomplished for our Lord? A lot of times I think we, we miss, if I'm saying this right, we miss the forest for the trees. We view everything that we have to go, that, that we have to do that day or this week. Um, and, and and that concern over that day and that week goes by, and then we're concerned about the next day and the next week. And then days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into months, and months turn into years, and years turn into decades. And before we know it, 10, 20, 30 years have gone by, and we've been concerned about the logistics of every day. But what in the end, when you zoom out your entire life, what will it what will you be able to say that the Lord did through your life? Maybe it was just being faithful day in and day out. Um, serving the Lord where he's planted you. Uh, spreading the gospel. Doing your part to support the work of the church, the ministries. And just being faithful to the Lord. If that's what the Lord has called you to do, then stay faithful at it. Keep, keep going. But search your heart and ask, Lord, am I doing everything? Give yourself a report card right now. Am I doing everything that I can um, to do what you've called me to do? Are, are there, is there somebody sitting in church because you invited them, because you extended a, a friendly hand, a smile, you, you showed them the love of Christ. You gave them the gospel. Um, you know, these, are, these are questions that we need to ask the Holy Spirit and listen for His response. And so um, maybe, maybe we need to rededicate ourselves tonight a little bit and uh, refocus, realign our, our, our purpose and, and what time we have left at whatever stage in life you are. There's some in this room that are still starting out. And some of us are closer to that day when we see Jesus than we were a year or two ago <laughs> or a decade or two ago. Let's stay faithful. Let's stay faithful. Great reminder tonight, a great, a great challenge, a great message. And uh, so you talk to the Lord and make any decision that he's, he's convicting you to make. And uh, let's stay faithful. All right, let's close in prayer tonight. Dear Lord, thank you, Father, for um, Brother M. Shama and, and him being here with us this week and giving us these reminders to stay focused and um, to stay with the right priorities in our lives, to not get sidetracked with temporary things, to not get discouraged um, by obstacles on the outside of the church, you know, that we face in the day-to-day -day life and maybe even disagreements or skirmishes on the inside of the church that we have with each other from time to time. But Lord, help us to stay focused on what matters. And in the end, Lord, help, help us both individually to be able to stand before you at the judgment seat and be able to have something left over. Um, when it comes time for rewards, some, some small nugget that we've spent our time that you've given us wisely and as an investment, being faithful to you. 
And um, Lord, corporately also as a church, I pray that you would help us to stay faithful, focused, and to, uh, to be effective in our community. We can't reach people we never touch. And so open doors of opportunity for us to, to interact and, and um, interface with our community, with, with those around us, and be able to spread the gospel and, and give people the good news and show people the love of Christ. And may their hearts that are troubled, that are fearful, that are angry, that are enraged over any, any reason under the sun, Lord, may, may their hearts melt in the light of the love of Christ and um, the, the good news of the gospel. We pray, Father, for revival in our own lives, revival in our own church, and help us to be effective witnesses in our communities, with our coworkers, with our neighbors. Help us to be soul conscious and help us to do it on purpose because it's not going to happen unless we do it on purpose. Lord, just uh, lead us, fill us with your heart, or fill us with your power, your strength. Empower us to uh, be able to do what it is that you call us to do. Help us to be yielded to you, to your directives on a day-to-day basis. Help us to walk the rest of this week with this challenge in mind, Lord, and asking you on a daily basis, Lord, what do you have for me today? And help us not to to miss the forest for the trees. Help us not to, to miss the big picture because what we have going on today is clouding that. Help us to always keep the main purpose uh, active and, and uh, going in the background. It's not to lose, to lose focus of our purpose. Lord, we love you. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. Thank you for having that focus and that purpose for us. And... Uh, Father, forgive us for our sin. Forgive us where we lack. And uh, dismiss us in grace now. Be with them, Shama. Give him safety as, travel, as he travels tomorrow on the, on the plane, back to his family. Bless his ministry. And thank you for the opportunity that we have to be a small part of it. In Jesus' name, I ask these things. Amen. Thanks for being here. You're dismissed. Have a great week. God bless.